two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the January 18th meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. To conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Fea if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Vea, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Good evening. Uh, Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Here. Ms. Hen? Here. Mr. Kuhn? Here. Thank you. OK, uh, Mr. Tantleff, please review the overview of the budget appropriation transfer BAT and budget line transfer BLT process. I think we need to take yeah. um, staff. Oh, I'm sorry, did I skip something? Yeah. That, that's oh. OK. Yeah. We, can, we need to call the roll of the staff. Like, OK, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Hartlove. Here. Mr. Tantlett? Present. If there are any additional staff participating that were not mentioned, please state your name now. Thank you. Back to you. Okay, well then we'll move on to new business. Um, uh, item two, overview of the budget appropriation transfer. Mr. Tantlett, please. Uh, review the overview of budget appropriation transfer BAT and budget line transfer BLT process. Uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Tomanowski, and pleased to meet you. Okay, I'll share the document. I think Ms. Faye just sent this one around right before the meeting. Yeah. Um, so other members, uh, this will be uh, a review because you've seen uh, this document before. Um, but one of the, uh, really one of the no numerous items that was the genesis for uh, the board voting to have budget committee was when we do our annual budget appropriation transfer, they were unsure of uh, what was going into the document and what they were voting on because they hadn't seen it previously. So um, what we've done, and I'll, it'll be the second agenda item, is we now do a quarterly budget line transfer that uh, leads up to the budget appropriation transfer. And uh, both budget committee and the BAT process was also identified um, as a recommendation in the big efficiency study last year. Um, so the process overview is the BCPS budget consists of 13 separate appropriations by activities that are defined by MSDE. We carry no contingency budget, so the only way to manage unanticipated expenses during the year is via amendments to the budget. Schools and offices request amendments to their budget by submitting budget line transfer or BLT requests to the Office of Budget and Reporting. And based on close monitoring of expenditures through the first three quarters of a fiscal year, expense, expense projections always show an overall surplus, but with shortfalls in some activities and surpluses in others. So uh, in other words, this process is not at all to increase the budget. It's simply to move things around administratively within the budget. So the BAT proposes to move funds from activities with a surplus to those with a deficit. Transfers of funds between activities requires approval from the Board of Education and the County Council. The Budget Committee receives updates on year-to-date transfers across activities via the BLT report that is presented following 
fiscal quarters. So just a really brief timeline is July 1st, the fiscal year begins and we start accepting budget line transfers. Uh, following Q1, we will um, review that report with the budget committee following Q2, which is today. So um, in January, we're going to review uh, the Q2 report, which is through December. And then the third quarter, um, we will show you an abbreviated report just covering January and February. We'll cover that on the March committee because February is the final um, year to date actuals and the cutoff for budget line transfers. So that forms the basis for the bat. Um, you can see mid February is the deadline for BLTs and following uh, February close. I just mentioned that um, April 18th, the bat will be presented to the board for approval. And then in early June, the bat will be presented to the Baltimore County Council for approval. Um, and that's what I have on this topic. I'd be happy to take any questions. <clears throat> okay, uh, I would like to thank Mr. Tyler for his information. I will call each committee member with questions. Mr. McMillian. Any questions? Ms. Ten. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Tantla, for the overview. Um, this is always helpful, even as a refresher when we receive these reports. Um, when you state that the only way to manage unanticipated expenses during the year is via amendments to the budget, um, I understand that that an amendment to the budget would also include any use of the fund balance. Is that correct? And can you speak to that process? Should we need to use the fund balance during the year? And by fund sure. balance, I'm referring to the general fund balance. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And that's, you know, timely since uh, not too long ago we did that uh, during FY23. So fund balance is outside of the BAT or BLT process because to use additional fund balance and uh, Ms. Domanowski, essentially what fund balance is, you can think of the net difference between revenue and expense at year end uh, kind of goes in the bank, if you want to think of it that way. Technically, the county um, could control the money at that point, but it's set aside and they've never, uh, they have to allow us to use it, but they've never, they've never tried to prevent us uh, from using it. But uh, that becomes another revenue source once it's in fund balance. So uh, during FY23 to fund the increases to employee compensation that got negotiated and agreed to after the year began, uh, the only source of funding for that was to use about $50 million in fund balance and our fund balance um, has gone up the last several years because of COVID, uh, especially in uh, you know 2020 when all the kids were home, uh, and of recent because we've had a lot of vacancies, our fund balance did uh, grow. So it was perfectly appropriate to use the 50 million of fund balance. Um, but at the time, uh, the county executive didn't like the first proposal, so we came back with a lower proposal, but that was actually a supplemental appropriation. So in other words, we increased the adopted budget uh, and it became what we call the adjusted budget, but it went up by 50 million. The BLT and BAT is different in that we're just moving money within the budget. Uh, any any follow-ups on that, Ms. Hen, or did that answer your question? It, it mostly did, thank you. Um, could you speak to the authority um, piece of that in terms of who can use fund balance or authorize it? Because that doesn't come back to the board. And there was a note in the budget book 
that said it was used for capital projects. So I'm just wondering under whose authority. Oh, so right. So you're you're so as a source after year end close, the county executive um, off uh, proposed and the council approved using 25 million of fund balance for our capital project. So 25 million of the capital budget in the budget book is uh, based on that additional $25 million of fund balance that you're referring to. And that appropriation was approved by the county council. It was during a, um, a process like the BAT process? No, it's it part of the adopted budget. It, no, they adopted it. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you very sure. much. Sure. Mr. Kuhn, any questions? Yeah, no questions. Thanks. Okay, then moving along. Uh, Mr. Taylor, please review the FY 2023 Q2 budget line transfer information. Sure. All right. Is that up on everyone's screen now? Yes. So uh, this is a big report, and this is only activity that occurred during Q2. It's not uh, a year-to-date report, but the Q1 report is posted. And in Q1, there's often um, more activity than normal because the schools are all adjusting their budgets. So if we went back uh, and looked at uh, Q1, you'd see many small transactions from the schools. But um, what we've done now, what we have here is uh, these are your typical transactions. The office will submit a budget line transfer to move money within their budget. So you can see it nets zero. So in the magnet office, um, they needed an appropriation that, to support uh, the magnet coordinator um, position at Randallstown. Um, so this this was when it says move from Hall back. So that was the central magnet office budget that they're pushing out to the schools. So um, all the magnet programs have a process where they propose a budget to the magnet office. The magnet office approves that budget. Then the magnet office. <clears throat> authorizes us or gives us instructions on how much money to push out to each school. So if you looked at a school budget, you'd see their uh, unrestricted general operating budget. You used to see a sub budget. They don't have that anymore because the sub budget is now managed by a contract via Kelly Services. Um, and then they have a magnet budget. Then there's some other uh, small things or unique things that certain schools may have, but magnet and operating are the two big ones that they have. So this gets pushed out and then the school, as they're spending things for magnet, they hit one, what we call appropriation. So think of it, they have a bucket of money for magnet and then they have their unrestricted school operating budget. They charge things to one or the other, depending on what the money is for. So these transactions were the it's it's not the main push out, but these were follow up um, push outs that the magnet authorized from their central budget. And you can see on all of these and many of them are small, like here, six, nine offset by fifteen hundred dollars. They all net zero. Um, and the the biggest thing that drives the appropriation in a simple sense is if it changes activities because you can't it's a, it's just a little more uh, nuanced than that but if you just think about it the different activities you can only spend things for that activity so often um, the school may plan in one area and not the yeah e I'm sorry, not a school, a central office. The schools also do it, but they have no restrictions. 
because there would be too many transactions. So we capture the schools all at once with the bat at year end. Um, so here you can see ESOL move $53,000 to um, put to purchase uh, Welcome Center furniture. And it was the right budget, but it was just in the wrong activity. So it was office furniture. It um, went into activity two from um, operating supplies, which are uh, which so it went into mid-level management, which is the office of the principal. Just a technical definition. Um, so I won't, you know, talk through each of them, but you can see they're mostly small. Um, and it's mostly central office moving items from point A to point B. And, and just to clarify, I just said it, but it, I might not have been clear. So the, the schools try to budget and project how much their expenses are and we give them tools for that. But we, we don't hold them accountable by activity like we do in central office because there's so many changes and there's so many small expenditures. We look at them as kind of one big budget and then uh, how, whatever all the activity movement is by year end or when we do the bat, if we need to, we'll, move, we'll, we'll correct all of that at once. So it's to make things a lot easier on the schools um, we do it that way. So you can see most of these things are just expenses that needed to go from one place to another. Either they had a new thing they wanted to pay for, or it just turned out it was budgeted in a different, the actual expenses were going to be a di in a different area than they originally planned. So you can see some small ones here and everything um, nets out to zero. Um, at options, pushed money out to Cromwell Valley. And then um, here's a long one, the Black Boy Mentoring Program. This is uh, being managed by the Equity Office. Uh, and it was a grant that has a lot of different transactions. So the original idea was to put it on ESSER. Um, but it's really difficult to manage as a grant. So what we did in, instead is we had some room in the general fund to push this money out to the schools. Um, and at the same time, what we had planned in the ESSER grant is to cover part of the magnet expansion. So last year we had a big magnet grant that sunsetted. So we had to cover that in the general fund this year and it all didn't get covered in the adopted budget. So we kind of, uh, C&I found some money, we found some money to cover that. And basically uh, we're doing a swap so that we can manage the Black Boy Mentoring Program in the general fund so that it's not highly transactional on the grant because in the grant, everything needs to tick and tie in terms of they need to document every transaction, needs to be within a certain amount of the budget. Um, and, and there's just a lot of transactions going on here that would have needed to be journal vouchered over. So this was just sort of a, a simple way to manage this program. And you can see there's a ton of line items because of all the appropriations that went out to all the schools. And you can see at the bottom here, it nets out to zero. Um, here's Avid Workshop. Uh, they just had had to pay for registration fees and it was in a different activity than they had originally planned it. Um, and here's just some money moving within CNI to blended learning. And um, here's some transfers for Medicaid. Um, now, this is a larger one right here for grounds maintenance. So um, both for for transportation and in um, different areas of facilities, because there's so many vacancies, they're using contracted services and uh, they're using money from their salary budget to cover that. So this is a good example of that. Uh, they moved 1.5 million. And we had to work with them to approve the amount, 
but we moved it out of salaries into contract services. You can Mr. see it's due to staff shortage. Mr. Tantliff, um, just yes. a cu couple of things I'm, you know, I'm thinking of as you're going through this, which is, it's a good, I like the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, um, the, the, the one of the driving reasons why we do this is because we have to do our budget so far in advance and that's just you know it's the nature of of how you know we have to do things like we're working on next year's budget now so we you know all of our offices all of our departments all of our principals they're trying to do the best job they can to budget things in the appropriate places but when you're putting the, those things together six to nine months in advance um it, it it makes it it it's challenging um to 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 get it exactly right so that's so you have this process to allow people to move things around um in a you know in a i think when we put it all together it, the the um significance on a percentage basis is not very high of, of dollars to get moved most of the dollars stay where they were originally budgeted uh, but really this is I don't know the exact percentage but when I don't know and I'm putting you on the spot Mr. Taylor but I don't know if the, the, when we get to the end of the year when we put this all together all the movements it represents I'm thinking a fairly small percentage of our total budget but I'm sorry if I put you on the spot I no, I mean the total bat can vary, but it we might move a total of fifteen or twenty million dollars typically from point A to point B. Um, you know, so it's a per percent of the operate of this general yes. fund budget. So yeah, so we're talking about ninety nine percent of our budget basically stays where it where it originally was purposed. So yeah, a lot of the transactions are very small, but they're showstoppers if it's in the wrong place. Um, so, uh, um, you can see here, this was um, just moving money around for the AP exams um, and the dual enrollment. They were just changing activity, so the money was in the wrong activity. It's going from uh, four to five and five. Um, just to this one's just a different unit, so that stayed within the same activity. So they were just cleaning up uh, where the money was good, going to be charged. They weren't increasing the budget for any of those things. Um, now here. You can see the supplemental appropriation, which was really big. Um, here it is. There's the BLT for 34 mil, 33 and a half million. This was the supplemental. So we had this, we were adding into the budget, um, but we had to move it all into the right place and push it into the budget. So um that is what's going on here so the supplement moved the money into the budget in just a couple line items but then it just needed to be farmed out into exactly where the expenditures were sitting so that's why it's on the blt the up uh, the supplemental is what actually added the money to the budget so this is not adding the money to the budget this is taking where the supplemental pushed it just to keep the supplemental more condensed and then we push the money out to where um, it actually gets spent. And that's, you know, a couple other little ones. And that's, you know, that's kind of the flavor. This is a pretty typical um, budget line transfer. So I'd be happy to answer any questions on this or the process. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Tanla, for the presentation. Um, I do have, can I go first with questions? <laughs> or should I call? Um, I each committee member will help. Uh, I will call each committee member with questions. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to ask about was moving the grant money to general fund. It's and you said it had to do with so you don't have to, you know, put different tags on it so that it. I, I guess I just. Isn't that the purpose of a grant fund to show that you're using it for the right reasons? Um, 
No, that was an option. When we decided to fund that program, we had to figure out how to fund it. So one option was to put it on ESSER. That would have been allowable. Um, but instead, we were able to cover it in the general fund. And instead, we moved the magnet funds into ESSER, which is where we had planned them. Uh, generally, a lot of some grants, all the expenditures go to the grant directly. But for instance, our biggest expense on ESSER is paying for the extra 15 minutes in the day, which is more than $30 million a year. That's done through a massive number of JVs because it's embedded in everyone's salary. So one of the analysts on my team needs to work with one of the analysts in accounting and push all that money out of the general fund into the grant. So a traditional grant like Title I, all the expenditures are budgeted and the actuals hit within the grant. Um, ESSER has some of that, but it's so massive that a lot of the expenditures are JV'd over to it. So uh, we had the option of what to put on uh, the grant and we chose to just, um, and it's, it's not a big expense in terms of ESSER, which is over $200 million. Um, so this was the the cleanest way to uh, handle and support that expended or that budget that that program. And and just to add to that, um, I would um, the ESSER the ESSER dollars are fairly unique, and this is it been you know kind of atypical. So we uh, we don't typically are not moving dollars from you know. Uh, many of our grants that we receive are very specific, so we wouldn't have this option. Uh, of, uh, but in, as Mr. Tantler said, the ESSER dollar, the ESSER, we had multiple options for what we could use the uh, the ESSER dollars for, and we just we just felt like from a uh, uh, an ease of management perspective, whether we paid for them out of the general fund or out of the ESSER dollars, it really you know it was it was kind of the same thing. Um, we were going to pay for you know one set of expenses out of ESSER and the other set out of the general fund. Both qualified for ESSER, so we had a choice, and we just chose the one that made the most sense for us um, uh, logistically. Um, but that is not typical. Typically, grants are very specific as to what you can use them for, and you're not moving dollars between grants and the general fund. So that is a really good question, and and, and but it's not. Like I said, ESSER is kind of a, 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 a it's, its own, you know, uh, kind of set of rules, and and it's actually we only have a year left, so we'll utilize these dollars, and that'll be the end of that. Miss Han, you had a follow up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I did, and Mr. Hartlove answered part of it. Um, thank you, Ms. Dominowski. Um, and that had to do with that distinction of restricted versus non-restricted, and moving between general and the special revenue fund and i i was questioning why we're moving um concentration of poverty um for one from special to general in the fy24 budget and there's one other um, blueprint grant that's being moved if they are restricted then those expenditures would be restricted what is the rationale for moving those to general um, so COP and TSI, Transitional Supplemental thank Instruction, you. I think was the other one you were thinking of, Ms. Hen. Yeah, thank you. Um, so those are now core, uh, although they have specific uses of the fund, those are considered core state aid now. Those come in bi-monthly payments along with all the other tranches, as you will, of state aid. Until this year, it was uh acted completely like a grant we could apply for carryover and it was reimbursable so the key thing about most traditional grants is you spend the money then there's a process where you input all your expenditures and then you get reimbursed for the expense that used to be how tsi and cop worked before blueprint was fully up and running but uh, now we get all of that money and it's not reimbursable. It comes in bi-monthly payments. Um, and we're also trying to get ready for the reporting requirements for Blueprint. Um, we're taking baby steps and we being uh, all of Maryland, 
We're taking baby steps in reporting this year just to get people ramped up for it, but the reporting requirements are in effect uh, at the beginning of FY25, so not this coming year, the year after. And what that report will look like, uh, nobody knows exactly, but it makes it easier for us um, and more understandable as an organization if we have all those blueprint funds in the general fund. In a way, it also really helps for transparency because sometimes people don't pay attention to special revenue. But for instance, this year, by far the biggest single driver of the increase in our budget is the increase in the concentration of poverty grant. So it it, it has restricted uses, but it really acts like the general fund. It's a big driver of the increase of blueprint, which is you know what everyone's talking about and what everyone wants to understand. Um, so it really makes sense to reside in the general fund. I, I hear what you're saying, um, but because it is such a big driver and I, I my logic is is different in that I see greater transparency in separating it into the special revenue fund. Um, the descriptions were removed from this year's budget book, the, the description of um, what it is, the schools that are receiving it, all of those details that are so rich from previous budget books um, was removed and you know the details of the expenditures um, are no longer included so from a transparency standpoint at least when I reviewed it I'm not seeing it and also um, just sorry I lost my train of thought um, what you you mentioned, and there's a description of this in the budget book, that general fund expenditures are generally non-restricted versus, like you said, these are still restricted. They have the same restrictions that they always have had. So I I follow what you're saying, but if, if we don't have any um, restrictions from MSDE as to how we need to report it, at least now <laughs> or until fiscal year 25, then from a transparency standpoint and from an information standpoint, um, keeping it in, in special revenue is far more transparent to our public where they can see the detail and um, it, the logic just doesn't make sense. Maybe you can ex expand upon um, how it makes our lives easier in terms of processing to have it within general, but. Well, I'd say, so one thing, we can always provide whatever reporting. First, let me just say the the funds are completely and cleanly segmented within the general fund. They have their own appropriation, their own unit. No money, no one else can tap into those funds. All the all the salaries are hitting that fund. So, uh, in terms of segmenting the money, it is clean, and we can pull reports any day of the week saying how we're going to spend the money. Um, your request is a good one, especially because COP is so big and such and TS. Well, actually, TSI, you may not realize that it's actually sunsetting in a few years, so that won't really be prominent, um, whereas COP will probably be bigger than Title I in the not too distant future. So there's no reason you couldn't request and we couldn't provide reports or even in the budget book, we could include a section on blueprint and expand it and include some of those uh, details because it really it is really important. I agree with you. We didn't. It, it just didn't happen this time. We didn't talk about that, but it's a good idea. And if it's helpful, you know, that's something we we could add in either the board book or, you know, more likely in the final adopted budget. Um, but the reports are out there and the expenditures, because what you're talking about is really seeing details up front in the budget book. Any ongoing reports would be exactly the same and anything that the board desired to see in the budget book, um, you know, that's, you know, it's a reasonable request that, you know, Dr. Williams, I think, would be open to that. Um, Mr. Tantliff, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't have a choice 
I think your I like your answer as far as we can give you the detail, but as far as like whether we put it in the general fund or the special revenue fund, I think we did a lot of discussions with our staff here centrally as well as we talked to other uh, counties, and this is kind of the probably the best way yeah. from an accounting perspective to account for them. But I, I don't know if you can add anything to that because I think we can give Ms. Hen, we can give you what you want, like Mr. Tantwood was saying, yeah. without actually moving them back to special uh, re, special yeah. funds. So uh, a key thing is it doesn't, uh, the, it doesn't act like a grant. A grant is almost always reimbursable. They give you the money if you spend it. If you only spend half the grant, you only get half the money. Now, nobody really knows. There could be implications for underspending uh, parts of our budget, but that's you know to be determined later. But right now, we are definitely getting all the money automatically, bi-monthly with all of our other revenue. So um, I think just giving some more upfront details would um, address what you were concerned about. And all, and also no carry forward either, carry over. That's the other. Yeah, there's no it's, carry forward. It it uh, doesn't act at all like a grant, um, as we know grants. And and I think that would be fine. I, I whenever we give the public less information than we've given them in the past, that's a concern for me because it, we're, we appear to be less transparent. That's that's all I'm. I'm saying we should be giving them more information, not less. And when there's a note in place of where there had previously been some some very helpful information, for instance, the school, the list of schools um, that received these funds in the past, and now there's all that's there now is saying we moved it to the general fund. Well, that that looks like we're being less transparent with our public. So at at least we need to provide them with the list of schools. Um, how it's being used. If if someone hadn't looked at the 23 or 22 budget books, they would have no idea what what this is. I went had to go back and and look at it to to refresh my memory and see. Oh, this is how we're using that. So um, that's some feedback. I don't know if it's too late to do it for this year. If we can publish an, an electronic you know addendum or or supplement online, that would be great. Um, my my last question on this, and I know we've got other board members that that probably have questions, um, has to do with tr the transactions you were mentioning, Mr. Tantliff. And by placing this within the general funds, is there um, more flexibility or freedom? I, I think you said in, in terms of ensuring that the transactions are documented. Um, are you still asking about COP? I'm yes, I am. The blueprint. Funding. Um, it, does it matter where they're tracked in terms of the documentation requirements and what the state's looking for? Um, well, in terms of reporting how we're spending the money, it's segmented and clean either way. I mean, if a grant we could report in detail on, the general fund we can report in detail on. Uh, I, I think what I was saying is, uh, just in general, a grant has tight restrictions on how much you can change within the budget. You know, usually it's like a 10% threshold and then you need to put in an amendment on your budget if you're moving money around within the budget. Obviously, within the general fund, uh, that is not needed. Um, but all, again, go ahead. I'm sorry, I cut you. I, I, I'm no, sorry. That's all right. That's right. I was uh, the other thing I was just thinking of, and that's it. Um, is the indirect cost. We charge grants um, an, an indirect cost rate uh, to, to, you know, to offset some of the kind of central cost of that grant. And we wouldn't we wouldn't be doing those that with these these funds. So I think it really comes down to it's not a grant. That's why we're accounting for it that way. But I think your point is well taken, Ms. Hen. We uh, certainly can um, can look into. I saw Mr. Uh, Tant with writing notes as you were speaking to to uh, um, to look for ways to to get that transparency back in um, future versions of of our budget book. So we can certainly do that for you. Thank you. And regardless of the placement, I think what I'm getting at with my last question is, are the same controls in place regardless of which fund we're tracking the expenditures against blueprint funding? Yeah, yes. the same set of controls. 
to ensure that the the spending is meets the restrictions. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. McMillian. Do you have any questions? Are you there? Mr. Kuhn, do you have any questions? I do have a question. Sorry, trying to find um, <clears throat> trying to find a mute button. Just real quick, if we could go back up to the Black Boy Joy split out of all of those various spendings. And I just want to clarify something. <clears throat> you stated, Mr. Tantliff, if you go to the top of that, there's um yeah there's a, a position of magnet funds so it looks like that this is paying for a contract employee and miscellaneous contracted activity like it's broken out why why is it broken out this way across every single school and just saying we have this employee that does this across the, across the entire school system. Um, no, this is what this is paying for is um, 1445 is uh, basically um, a temporary or extra um, expenditures. It's not, uh, it's more of a stipend. It's not a full time employee there. So you can see um, there might have been some extra time in Dumbarton. They needed, you know, X number of hours in their budget to um, pay someone to do some part of the work. So it's not paying for one person and splitting them up a million ways. It's actually spending hours of work in each school to you know, support the program. Isn't that the same thing though? But it's extra hours for, it can be extra hours for an existing employee. It's not one person doing all the work. And then 20, 2834, the miscellaneous contracted services. Yeah, that and would be a con, house. that would be a contract. You're paying, you could, I mean, you could pay for cleaning services. I mean, they're not paying for cleaning services, but I'm saying you're paying money on any contract. That's what that's for. It's not a person. Right, but it's the same contract, I guess, is my point. It's just spread across. Yeah, but the schools. budget's in, but because each school has their own budget. Okay. You know, we have lots of contracts, right, that each school takes a chunk of. And we wanted to hit their budget so we have the expenditures in the right place and each school has a certain amount budgeted to pay for even if it's all on the same contract so you're the board is centrally approving one contract and then people are taking bites of it and it hits their um their their but you know their particular budget And I'm not an expert on the program, but I believe, you know, they're they're allocating funds out to the various, I believe, mostly middle schools, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, but they're they're allocating the funds out, um, and then the schools are getting guidance sent from central, but they have some flexibility within within that guidance to do some things. You know, some may may be more weighed towards the employee. Some may be more. Uh, uh, um, Toward, towards the field trips and so on. So they, you know, they have some, they have some, you know, school by school uh, um, um, say in what they want to actually do with the, with the dollars. But each school could have a, a slightly different plan and do things a little bit different, and that would be okay. And I and I I know our I think that that word contract employee I think kind of throws us off. I think it'd be better if we called them temporary or hourly or something like that. But um, yeah, the contract employee versus the contracted services are two different things, so. All right, thank you. Right, I'm gonna let you talk, but I wanna just follow up really quick. Um, so all the contracted services are, um, you know, specified out to cert all the middle schools, except for the one for 60 grand that says college and career. Um, I I guess because why is that? Where were you looking? 
Um, was it like in the, this program yeah. or somewhere it's else? It's in the, yes, it's in the same program. That's why I was, I was following up. It's, I can't see what line it is. It's, um, it's the third one down under um, the, the, the boy joy and genius. It's the first like deduct, it's the first, yeah, I guess, increase. There's, yeah, um, right there. Yeah. Um, this is, I'm assuming this is probably, uh, so I don't know the exact answer, but I'm assuming this is a central office component of the program. So um, career and college readiness is managing a chunk, probably the main part of possibly the exact same contract centrally, and then they're pushing out little pieces of it to each school. So this is this. This is just a central office component of that program. Mr. McMillian, did you get your uh, mic to work yet? He's typing. No, he did not. OK, well, if you have a question, um, put it in the chat and I'll, I'll ask it for you. Um, one other thing, and I don't know that if, if this is if, if I can ask this. So the ESSER grant, can you just um, you said it was going to expire. You have to use it up by the end of this year. Um, yeah, I can. Do you want me to show you a little brief? summary of it are we uh, are that do you want me to move off of this or do you want me to just explain the grant or i guess i'm just trying to figure out um i know you're saying moving the general fund that it makes it easy like we don't need to use that grant but if you have it there to use why aren't we using it and also it kind of goes in the same way of um, is there a breakdown of the COVID, COVID relief grants? I've been getting a lot of questions of when are we going to know where that money has gone? And especially with our budget being so over budget this right now that we're we're looking at, um, I'm just trying to figure okay. out. Yeah, there, there's a lot of, of uh, and, and we get that, that a lot. Um, I think Mr. Mr. Tantliff uh, talked about the one item, the 15 minutes. That's where a good chunk of the of the dollars are have, are going, um, as well as um, some of the uh, the various incentives that we've that we've utilized dollars for. Um, we have some positions um, uh, on ESSER, and we certainly uh, could get you uh, more detail. Um, and the challenges are with the dollars obviously is is that they're one time dollars whether we we have this influx of dollars um right now and uh, but they will come to an end so any of the positions in particular or as mr tantliff referred to the 15 minutes that are going to continue on after esser is done are really a challenge for us because eventually these things we're either going to have to make we're going to have to make decisions we either continue those items and um, and absorb them into the general fund, or we stop doing them. Um, so I, so though that's our our challenge really is not how is not to spend them. Our challenge is to spend them in such a way that it doesn't um, marry us into future uh, uh, general fund spending that you know we're not going to be able to absorb so we've got the big challenge with the 15 minutes uh when the grant when the grant runs out we're going to have to that's going to have to be absorbed into the general fund budget we know that um and then uh we have some positions some of which are very much uh covid related or i should say, say pandemic related they're part of the recovery and they naturally should sun you know kind of sunset which is good then there are others that i think we we've come to depend upon and 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 think they're good and they're doing a good service for our students those we're probably going to want to try to absorb into the general fund budget so right now the um the challenge is not this year because this this upcoming year 24 because we have dollars we have ESSER dollars uh 
through um, fiscal year 24. But at the end of this upcoming year, fiscal year 24, um, in the next fiscal year budget, you're going to we're going to be having lots of conversations about um, items that are currently covered by ESSER that are going ESSER is going away, and we're going to have to figure out whether we're going to continue to do them or 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 not. So I think right now with with uh, with the utilization of these dollars. Um, we're really more looking towards the off ramp of, of moving away from the dollars than trying to. We, the, I think we, we we don't want to put more ongoing items, even if we could. I don't think we could, but if we could, I don't think we'd want to do that because that's just going to add to that 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 uh, they call it the fiscal cliff. They're gonna they're going to it's going to add to that to that uh, concern. So. Um, so hopefully that you know I, I threw a lot of information I kind of rambled, but hopefully that answers some of your question. Yes, uh, a little. I, I have one more follow up, and then Rod it seems like he got his um, microphone to work. Just can we? Is there a way that we can provide um, to our constituents and to our public um, exactly what was allocated by the pandemic relief money? Um, I know there was a there was a lot of money that was given to the Baltimore County School System and I, I have there's a lot of people that want to know exactly how it was funded and just or what it was used for. Um, when will be the next update as far as what what that money was used for and how much of it was used? We can definitely uh, get you an updated uh, uh, report. Um, we did an amendment recently within the last couple of months um, related to um, some of some of the uh, um, incentives that were negotiated um, as part of this in compensation, uh, this most recent compensation package. Some of those items were covered by ESSER. In particular, none of the ongoing items, but the ones that were bonus, the ones that were one time in nature, they seem to be a good match for the dollars because the you know the nature of a bonus is we're giving it to you now, but we're not saying you're going to get this every year. So, um, for instance, we have a uh, a one thousand dollar retention uh, bonus that all employees are going to receive uh, in the spring. That's being paid for out of ESSER. The beauty of that is we you know just we're paying it now. It's a one time item, and there's no um, you know there's no uh, promise to do that in the future, so it's the perfect item for that. But certainly, I think it's a, it's a valid question. It's a large amount of dollars, and uh, we certainly can get you the most up to date um, um, uses so far. There's you know there's part, there's two parts of this. There's what we've already used, and then there's what's remaining in our plan for those. So we can certainly get that that to you um, um, as part of the budget process. Thank you, Rod, Mr. McMillian. Yeah, Mr. T can you hear me now? Yes, sir. OK, Mr. Tanner, if I'm sorry, I've had issues with this microphone. I want to go back okay. to fund balance. I'm trying to understand fund balance the way you described it earlier. Uh, and, and here's here's what, how I'm trying to understand this. People often say to me that we have positions that are not being filled. And I'll give you an example. There's there's a print, a, a job in a print shop that's been open since last February when the guy retired. Now, with that money that's not being spent to pay that gentleman because the position's opened, would that be money that ends up going into the fund balance? Yeah, generally speaking, yes. But it's it's the aggregate because, you know, there's pluses and minuses all over, but whatever the net of all of that is goes into fund balance. But in a simple sense, yes, if you have a vacancy, that money at year end would go into fund balance. And, Thank you. and just to piggyback on that, Mr. Tantliff, and we also budget for some amount of turnover. So some we have to meet, we have to meet whatever turnover that we right, budgeted. Right. So some we do assume that there's going to be some positions, you know, do, it, that we we would never be a hundred percent all of our positions being not vacant all all days of the year. So there's always a, there there's all we always. Um, having some vacant positions, not that we hold. I mean, th th when I say that, I want to make sure it doesn't get confused. Not that we have positions that we permanently hold, 
but you know we we have a vacant position today we find somebody we hire them tomorrow and then somebody else leaves and that creates another vacant position so we're almost always having vacant positions out there so when we put the budget together we do assume that there's going to be some of that so we have to meet that and part of that savings would go towards meeting that but then some of it would end up potentially going into fund balance thank you Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Comments? Follow ups? Going once. Okay, um, if that is all, then the last item on the agenda is announcements. Um, the next budget meeting um, is set for February. Um, I was, I want to get um, actually. I wanted to get thoughts from everyone about having a meeting possibly next week on Wednesday um, just because of the budget and to get more information. I know we're having um, an informative session on Tuesday. Um, maybe we can have it. Uh, what are everyone's thoughts on having another uh, a budget meeting before February? And Ms. Dominowski, just before you, John, I just to add something to that. We, you know, the plan is for the work session on Tuesday, where we will, you know, we will begin to go through the budget. The goal, I believe, is to get everything done in that one work session. But it's possible, and I don't want to overstep my bounds here, but it's possible that that could linger into a second meeting. Um, I would suggest and it's just my suggestion obviously that that you would schedule if you're going to go down that road of scheduling another um, uh, budget committee meeting you would do it after the budget has all the work sessions are finished that way you would have all the information um, um, because otherwise some of the questions could be answered at the work sessions so so that's all i would throw out there okay miss hen thank you um i do support the idea of another meeting following the first work session. I think there might be some follow up items that we need clarification on and the time constraints are always so hard to to deal with in the main board meeting and Mr. Tantliff, Mr. Hartlove, um, you guys are fantastic and I, I truly appreciate your support um, and would really appreciate the opportunity to ask any follow up questions following the work session. And if there are any recommendations that this committee wants to bring to the full board, I would like to have the opportunity to formulate those and to do so prior to um, the last work session or prior to the vote on the budget. I believe we normally make motions at the last work session if we have a second one scheduled. So know that we do. There's not right now. There's just one scheduled. Just one scheduled. Then we I could do so when we vote in February. But I, I said I was only going to make one comment. I got one other comment, and then I will. <laughs> I promise to be quiet. Um, my my other comment is, I have nothing against doing it the the day after the Wednesday. But if there are things that come out of there that you want us to kind of produce any kind of information, it would be nice to have a little bit of a window there. So if you said, you know, we would like some more information on this or that, if we had some some period of time just to be able to get that together, otherwise it may not be as useful if if you know if it's the very next day. So that's you know, I just throw that out there as is consideration. No, that's very that's very helpful. Um, um, I guess could I I would like to schedule the next budget meeting for Monday, January 30th at 5 30 p.m. Would that work? Works for me. Works for me. And that's good from a staff perspective. I'm I'm sorry <laughs> to interrupt. So approved. Yes. One one question for Mr. Hartlove, Ms. Domanowski. Yes. Um, does that work if we um, need your guidance on any motions that we intend to make, any costing of proposals? Is that enough lead time? I mean, it depends on what it is. I mean, and, and I'm okay. promising for Mr. Tantliff, he, he's going to do all the work. He's he's going to do all the heavy lifting for for estimates and things like that. So I should probably let him jump in here. You know, it, dep it really depends on what you're, I mean, if you're asking for something really complex, 
you know, it, it, it takes more more time to do. Um, if it's something, you know, more simpler, uh, then you know uh, that's plenty of time. So it, it, I guess it would depend on what the request ends up end up being. Sure, and and some of those may come in the form of questions, which I believe are due today by end of business or were due at close of business. So you'll and, be getting some we, at a time. The the other thing too is, is we have you know we could do the meeting on the thirtieth, and then I think we have another meeting. I'm not sure what date it is. It's I guess you were you were announcing it because we could all we could also say you know, we'll answer whatever we can on the thirtieth, and then whatever we can't answer, we'll bring to the next budget committee meeting. Because I think uh, that's. Go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. No, I just wanted to add, um, submitting questions. You know, like we're doing now, especially for things that are complex. It's much easier to give you a good answer if we see the questions in advance and can grab the right people to answer them. So in other words, if we get together um, and we're you know, just asking questions in the book, hopefully we can answer a lot of them, but there's a lot we would need to re, you know, refer them to other people. So, it's, so one thing at the big work session, all the staff is there, all the chiefs and their EDs if needed are there so questions can be answered. It's just it's just something to keep in mind in the differences between the two forums. Yeah, that sounds um so if I if I set the next budget meeting for Monday, January 30th at 5 30, and I will encourage all um mem committee members to submit their questions prior to that meeting, hopefully, you know, by Friday. If, if they have something pressing that we will get that to you. So if there's something that you need to look up ahead of time um, that we'll be able to do that that day. That makes sense. Yeah, I, yeah, I would I would just, you know, just think about do you want to do that or are you really asking for another works a dedicated work session? You know what I mean? Well, I, I'm just I, I think we I would like to have another uh, budget committee meeting after the work session because I, I I have a feeling things will come up that I that we will all have more questions about and won't have be able to ask them all in that time frame. That 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 makes sense. I mean, we can certainly um, take what whatever transpires in the first. Maybe we do it this way. Whatever transpires in the first work session, um, uh, we talk about at the next budget committee meeting. Plus any questions you have and then if it's an item that's going to come up at, at if there is a second work session and there's an those items are going to be discussed in that second work session maybe we hold off on those um at that budget committee meeting and we wait until after that okay but i still would like to set um the next budget meeting for monday january 30th no nope, i think that's i think that's great i think okay. that we're, we're we're prepared and we'll make as much use out of it you know we'll try to get you as much good information as we can so it's a useful uh time um and i think mr tantlett makes a good point i mean we we all, the more we know ahead of time the better we can get answers and we can also try to get staff there because if you wanted to drill down on for instance we have the the esol teachers in the in the budget if if you wanted to for instance, talk in more detail about what they'd be used for or, you know, how they'd be allocated to schools. We would probably want to get somebody um, who knows programmatic, not that wouldn't be something for Mr. Tantler for myself. That would be more of a programmatic um, question that we would want to have the right staff here, um, you know, to the extent possible, we'd, you know, we're, we'll try to do that. OK. That sounds great. So then the last item will be the next budget meeting, which is Wednesday, uh, I'm sorry, Monday, January 30th at 5.30. Um, is there any further business? Hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for joining us. Thanks everyone.